Lucky Luke is one of the first comics I can remember reading, or at least attempting to read because I had these French copies, but even with the language barrier, I fell in love with this character and his associates. Now that in a way, this is going to be a good episode to sit next to the episode analysing Hergé's storytelling in Tintin, as both Hergé and Morris did have similar qualities, as did a lot of comics in Europe of a similar time. But there is something that Morris does with his colour and lighting choices that I think are particularly interesting, and we're going to dive into it in this episode. You're watching Strip Panel Naked, I'm Hass, and I'm going to show you some of the cool stuff lurking in the pages of some of the best comics. So the big thing with Morris for me is his colours, which are really, really quite brilliant, you know, even today. I'm looking at digital editions of the Cinebook English translations, which are faithful reproductions as far as I'm aware, albeit likely on a different paper stock, and of course different as digital editions, but I think the quality of the work is still very clear and evident. Typically, characters and scenes are rendered in this pretty, you know, white light way, that is, as you'd expect to see them under kind of normal lighting conditions. But much of Morris's decisions in cases where it's not that seem to come down to either emotional value or depth. And in this way, it's where I'd argue that cinematic conventions are mostly felt. And it's not so much that Morris is replicating cinema, as he is taking something from cinema, that of lighting, and figuring out a way of applying it to the comic form. What lighting is used for and what it does, and seeing how colours can do a similar thing in the comic form. And because Lucky Luke is really a humour comic, there's a lot Morris can get away with in these colour choices. There's a page early in Lucky Luke Adventures 35, The Singing Wire, where Lincoln is speaking to Sibley. That panel of them sat across from each other at the table is a standard look, right? It's nothing too emotive, just two characters in Morris's style talking. Sibley is ahead of the Western Union, and Lincoln is telling him he wants to finance the telegraph line so people can send telegrams. So when we hit the next panel, and suddenly Sibley is entirely rendered in red with this yellow background, it makes the whole thing completely out of place with the panel it's next to. But the dialogue provides the key, as Sibley speaks as a telegram saying the word stop when he finishes each sentence. It's ridiculous, of course, and then Morris is helping signify this with this odd and dramatic colour change for the panel, which gives it more emphasis. And so that's the first reason we see Morris take a step like that, right? To give panels a certain extra punch, either into a motive or the surreal. And a page later, Luke arrives with a letter for an engineer, who reads it and yells Yahoo, while the background drops out from the moment and he turns entirely red, save for his distinguishing feature, which is his teeth. And this happens throughout, right, in various colours, you know, blues, oranges, greens and red. Sometimes the background is yellow or orange, sometimes with no background at all. And interestingly, the Yahoo panel is actually a rare exception in how the words are portrayed, as most of the time Morris uses the striking colour choice as a way to add emphasis to words in the panel, which are usually led in the same way as the rest of the comic is. When looking at it this way, you can see how Morris uses these moments as visual punctuation, that hits immediately and impacts directly on the way you see the lettering while still keeping everything fairly natural and, like most Bandesine, readable on a textual level, as much as what we talked about in the Hergé episode. With this example later on, you know, Luke realises he and Gamble are about to be saved, as someone is out there in the desert with them, and this panel has this big expression and Luke coloured completely red as he tells Gamble to look. But there is nothing different in the dialogue size or rendering, beyond those exclamation marks. And yet, if you look at that tier of imagery, it's so obviously jumping right out at you. So by doing that, he adds punch to something without having to take away the readability of it. And if you look a little earlier in Morris's work, so this was in 1977, but we can jump back to 1960, you can see elements of this in there too, in a very slightly different way. For example here, Joe Dalton's face is red in a few moments, though the rest of him is rendered in the more traditional way. And you can see later in the story more examples of characters who are red, but usually with either another character rendered normally in the same panel, or with a normal background around them. Instead, in this, the colour choices seem more subdued blues and browns in these instances when isolated from reality around them, and the number of moments generally is much, much lower. So you can see how Morris is figuring this out as he goes as he tells these stories, and eventually he gets to the point which I guess he was happiest with in the later editions of Lucky Luke. You can see him playing with what works, where you can get the impact, what's too much, what to pull back. And it's even traceable as far back as Lucky Luke's very first story in 1948, Morris was drawing these for a long time, where full red characters appear within the panels in expressive moments, either those of shock and dialogue, or those of action. Here, Morris uses these red characters so much more than he did on the book from the 60s, but in not a single instance does he ever break a character outside of a panel, or use the expressive colour backdrop. So you can see this experimentation happening through that time, you know, going from many uses, to changing the colour attempts in the 60s strip, to finding somewhere between the two. But in all cases, relying on colour, even as far back as 1948, to add impact to moments that take place within the structured grid of so many European comics. Because as the Hergé episode will show you, and through much of these examples from Lucky Luke, accessibility and readability seem primary concerns for a lot of these comics. 
So Morris had to find a way to allow his comics to be readable, but also have that over-the-top cartoonish quality that required for his sort of slapstick comedy western tales. As his art developed and shifted from that thicker, inkier look to the thin-lined, ever so slightly scratchier look of his latest strips, one thing remained pretty consistent from the beginning, which was his colours. And in that is a good understanding of how he could utilise colour to make individual panels and individual characters in panels become the punctuation of the scene. Morris was working past the dialogue. He was looking at each page as a visual piece. Each tier is a sentence. How do you fit the punctuation into that? How do you fit the exclamation marks or the question marks or the surprise? Visually, so that someone looking at this immediately gets that response. And you realise it's not in the text, because text takes the time to read, but it's in the visuals which hit you immediately. And this kind of punctuation in the scene is something you'll find in just about every modern comic on the stands today. Thanks for watching. If you're a fan of Strip Panel Naked and would like to support it, you can via the Patreon, where you'll get access to years worth of exclusive content as well. And you can find the two-time Eisner nominated magazine that I edit at panelxpanel.com and follow me on Twitter at HassanOE. Finally, hit subscribe and that notification bell to keep up to date with all the latest episodes and I'll see you next time.